Washington Alliance. It's great to see all of you today, whether you're here in person or watching online. We're so glad to have you. Can you believe this is our first service of 2024? I'm the only one. Okay, well, it feels like just yesterday we were loading up on toilet paper, right? For the turn of the century. And here we are, 2024. Like, what happened? Uh, somebody told me when I was a kid, I was probably early junior high, I'm guessing, who knows, maybe earlier, maybe later, who knows. The, uh, an older person said that time goes faster as you get older, and I laughed, I'm like, it can't, it still goes the same, it's just that's not possible. I felt kind of smart talking to them, but as you get older, right, it's like continually faster, we're in a, feels like a sprint, but... Hey, we're so glad to have you. A little bit of housekeeping before we jump in. Um, you heard about the DR, and we do have these uh, prayer cards, kind of bookmark looking things at the back at the Connect Center. We've updated them. I think they're as the current as we can make it. Uh, as you know, with these things, every, every time you do it in a year, there's just things change with people's health or whatever, and some can't go or some uh, jump in at the last minute. But we think we've got it as up to date as we can back there. Please grab one of these and pray for them. You don't have to know the name. That's not the point. It's that we're lifting them before the Lord, that God would use them uh, while they're at the DR. Next week, we're going to pray both services for those, uh, that group that's heading down there. Uh, two Saturdays from yesterday, I believe, is when they leave. Um, but I want to challenge you to not just pray the safe prayer. And if you're going to the DR, you're thinking, okay, Pastor Brian, why are you not telling them to do that? Now, the safe prayer is good, right? Safe travel, safe health, da, da, da. But I think sometimes God wants us to pray the challenging prayer. Uh, God, move through me. God, do something new in me. God, challenge me in a way that I never saw coming. Uh, and how maybe you relate to somebody down there or leading somebody to the Lord or just what God wants to say to your heart. Uh, and, and that's for all of us in life in general. But I want to I challenge you that way for this group, that you would pray the hard prayer for them, the challenging prayer that God would really uh, uh, upset them, let's put it that way, really uh, move them, stir in them. And uh, we're going to be anxious to hear what uh, God does in and through them when they get back. Uh, while we're talking about handouts, if you don't have a note paper today, uh, this would be the day to really jump into this stuff. Whether you're a note taker or not, maybe you just do it for this series. Uh, but you're going to want to have this over the next four weeks, I believe, in my opinion, uh, because we're going to be sharing a lot of very good um, material, not because I came up with it, but because the Lord did. Uh, yeah, let's give him credit. Uh, you saw in the video uh, that wasn't the Matthew bumper video, and I know some of you are like, okay, when are we going to finish Matthew? This has been really good. Others are like, when are we ever going to finish Matthew? Um, but we are, I promise. Um, by Easter, we're going to be done with Matthew. But there's something I've been praying about, and I promise it really is. You're like, no, it won't be. Yeah, it really is. But something I've been praying about is this idea of finances, money, um, it's something that's been on my heart for a while, something that's on, been on our leadership's heart for a while. And we were just praying, okay, God, when do we want to tackle this? Uh, when do we want to talk about it? And we felt like now is the, the right time. Now, if you've been part of our church, Washington Alliance Church, for any number of years, you know this is not a topic that we talk a lot about. We don't uh, designate series after series, the first of every single new year uh, other than this year talking about this. I mean, we pray for our tithes and offerings every week. We thank the Lord for what his people give to his church to be used for him and by him and for this community and the ends of the earth. We pray for the missions fund. We really hit that in October during missions month uh, about what God is doing across his planet and worldwide missions. But you'll know we, this isn't something we constantly talk about, you know, and if you've not been part of a church for a while or you're maybe just back or you're new, you know, the stigmatism that uh, the church only always is asking for money, always asking for money. Um, well, that's not necessarily uh, our stance, and you've been here for a while, you know that. But um, we believe, I believe, this is something needed. Uh, we need to hear this. I need to hear this. I believe you need to hear this. God's people need to hear it. And we need to know what God says about it as well. Now, if you were here last month for our annual meeting, uh, you would have heard how our budgets uh, this year is a lot less than last year. Uh, you know we're, we're, we have the Building for the Kingdom campaign, and incidentally, February 4th, we're going to have a special meeting in the evening uh, for that as we look at beginning the interior phase of that project, and we would love for you all to be here uh, for that. Now, I'd be lying to you if I said that didn't play a little bit of a part in this series. Absolutely, it does. 
But the reality is it plays a small part into the bigger picture. Why is this so important? Why is it such an important topic? Because Jesus said it was. That's number one. Jesus believed that this was a a very big topic, so much so he talked a lot about it. How much, you ask? He wasn't afraid to talk about money. He actually, outside of the kingdom of God, that that, uh, idea of the kingdom of God, Jesus spoke more about this than any other topic. It was his favorite topic. Jesus spoke more about money and possessions than about faith and prayer combined. He spoke more about money and possessions than heaven and hell. That's how important it was. God speaks of it all through uh, the Old and the New Testament in his word. Uh, So much so, there's 2,300 verses, over 2,300 verses in the Bible about money, wealth, and possessions. 11 of Jesus' 39 parables, we'll look at one today, 11 of the 39 speak of finances. It's the most uh, talked about topic that Jesus spoke of. So much so that if we as pastors were to speak on finances as much as Jesus did, we would have to have a sermon about it every third Sunday. That's how often we would preach about finances. So this is one of 17 messages you're going to hear to the end of the year. You good? Right? No, I promise there won't be that many. Just four. Why did Jesus speak so much of it? Why did God include it in his words so much? Because Jesus knew that this issue of money and possessions has the power to consume and derail us more quickly than anything else. It's true. There are very few topics that have more spiritual and practical implications for our lives, for our marriages, for our families, for culture, our nation, and our world than how we handle money or how money handles us. It's that important. And God is very uh, concerned about it, most of all for us and our spiritual growth. Let me give you a few statistics of why this is important. These are current within the last 8 to 12 months variety of resources. I didn't uh, list the resources, but there's a variety of them. 80% of Americans, 80% of Americans are in debt. 43% of couples married more than 25 years ago started off in debt. That doubles for those couples that were um, married within five years. 86% of couples married five years or less started off in debt. I think we have a a slide for that there. Put that up. There you go. 86% it doubles. Married five years or less, started off in debt. Of those 86, of that 86%, 41% of those people say they felt pressured to spend more uh, than they could afford on their wedding. Of that 86%, 41% of them said that. Nearly two-thirds, 63% of all marriages start off in the red, start off in debt. This is fact. A couple more. 62% of couples who argue in their relationship argue over disagreements about money. And of those arguing about money in their relationships, the average consumer debt is $30,000. That's just a a general statement. But here's possibly the most alarming statistic. Nearly 40% of marriages that end in divorce, it's because of money. That's alarming. It's alarming to me. It should be alarming to you. It's certainly alarming to God because it breaks his heart. Why? Because God created marriage. Marriage is not a human institution, something that man just kind of made up one day, sitting around doing nothing. No, God instituted this. This was his design for his glory, for his purposes. And yet 40% of those that end in divorce is because of financial issues. One of the things that we really need to understand right up front is that this always is a heart issue. Money is a heart issue. Our finances is a heart issue. God knew this. Jesus in his, his um, ministry on earth, when he came to earth, and, and there's 30 plus years that he spoke, he knew this, he spoke about it, and he doesn't mince words when it comes to this topic. Let me uh, show you a couple scriptures right off the bat. If you have your Bibles, incidentally, open up to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 16, and this is going to be a, a chapter where we, we really camp out in the next four weeks. Uh, Luke 16, incident, um, in particular, verse 11 is where we're going to be uh, focusing. Uh, And also, if you want to put a finger in the book of Proverbs, uh, there's several verses we're going to look at this morning. We don't have them all on the screen. Uh, So again, if you're taking notes, you're going to write these down. Just verse after verse after verse that God gives us about this important topic. 
While you're looking that up, Matthew 6, we've been going through that book together in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus speaks in chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. He says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then look how Jesus ends this verse, verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Luke records this same challenge in Luke 12, verse 34. It's about your treasure, it's about your heart, more importantly. The heart is the center of this this matter. Esther Doratic once said, A heavenly perspective on money allows you to trust the treasurer, capital T, a person, the person of Jesus, rather than the treasure, lowercase t. That's what Jesus is saying, having a heavenly perspective of our finances, and that makes us focus on the treasure, on Jesus, rather than the treasure. This is a topic that God cares deeply about, especially of how it relates to our spiritual growth. Some of you know the name Randy Alcorn. He's an author, written several books, some on finances. He puts it this way. It is impossible to become a fully developed follower of Jesus, a fully developed follower of Jesus, without also becoming a fully developed um, steward of your resources. Let me say that again. Randy says it is impossible to become a fully developed follower of Jesus without becoming a fully developed steward of our resources. It's true. And God speaks of it um, a lot throughout his word. Jesus made it clear that how we handle money has eternal consequences. In Luke chapter 16, if you're there, you'll see a story, again, one of the parables that Jesus gives, and it's centered around stewardship. It's centered around finances. Jesus speaks of this story of this rich man who had a manager overseeing his finances. The manager was not doing a very good job. He was failing in a lot of ways, and the finances weren't up to par. And the the rich man calls his manager in and says, listen, you better get these finances in order or you're going to be fired. Well, that's all the manager needed to hear because he realized that if he gets fired, he is in real, real trouble. He's not going to be one to go out and dig ditches. He's not one to ask for favors. So he knew the only thing that I can do is get some friends, maybe that I don't even have, to become my friends so that I have a place to stay. Because if I'm fired, I'm not even going to have a place to stay. So he, he begins by calling in some of the employees. And he calls the first one and says, hey, how much do you owe my employer? And he says, well, I owe 800 gallons of, of uh, 800, um, he owes 800 gallons of something. What does he owe? 800 gallons of oil, olive oil, that's what he owes. I was going to say wine, but it wasn't that. 800 gallons of olive oil. And the manager says, well, you know what, just take that bill and change it to 400. You can imagine, like, well, that's good. Calls the next guy, and how much do you owe? I owe 1,000 bushels of wheat. He says, you know what, why don't you just change that to 800? And the rich man is kind of amazed at the shrewdness of this, of this employee, of what he's trying to do, of gain these friends for his own benefit. It led Jesus to say this in verse 11. And if you're untrustworthy, Jesus says, about worldly wealth, Who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? If you're following along, look two verses later in verse 13. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate the one and love the other. You will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot, Jesus says, you cannot serve both God and money. That is a pretty straightforward challenge. It's pretty black and white, is it not? Or red, depending on what Bible you're using. Jesus said it. So we're going to spend the next four weeks talking about this topic because it's important to God. We want to learn about God's principles, his promises for our finances. And we've actually decided to call this series generous with an emphasis on those last two letters, the U and the S. We think about the word generous and just how generous God has been with us. I mean, think about that. Think our DR people who will be leaving in, in a week or so, a couple weeks, you've ever been to a third world country or a very impoverished area 
It sometimes is a wake-up call for you. you. And it certainly was for me. I remember the first time I, I went to Cambodia, I went to Mongolia a couple times in the Dominican, and seeing uh, people living on a dollar, two dollars, three dollars a day. And I'm reminded of how I've been blessed, right? And how a lot of times I'm foolish with how I've been blessed. And so we all can agree that God has blessed us individually. He has blessed us as a church family. He's been so generous to us. And the U and the S kind of play on words there at the end. That is you and I. And how do we factor into this? How do we respond to the generosity God has blessed us with? And so we're going to look at that over the next four weeks. I want to say that I've um, got a lot of these, uh, the research from a friend of mine, Pastor Tom Lundeen. He pastors a, a very large church out in Minnesota, been pastoring for many, many decades, far longer than me. And um, Orchard Alliance, which is a uh, financial institution that we partner with, we're going to talk more about throughout this series. Uh, they have used uh, this, this series and a lot of the research he's done in several other churches as well. And so I want to thank Pastor Tom for allowing me to use a lot of this information that he is, and his team has researched. So steps to financial planning, that's what we want to look at this morning, steps to financial planning and really a, a plan for financial freedom. What does that look like for you and I? Before we jump into these steps, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Would you join me? Father God, we thank you for an opportunity to come together again, to gather this new year. We thank you for this new year, Lord, and just anticipate great things of uh, things to happen because, Lord, you're a great God. And Lord, as we dive into this very important topic, a topic that you are uh, very concerned about, you wrote so many passages in Scripture about it, it's a, a topic that is, is close to your heart, stewardship, our finances, money. Lord, help us to have our eyes and ears, our minds, especially our heart, open to your leading. Father, fill us fresh with your Holy Spirit this morning. And guide us through this, Lord, to challenge us where we need challenged, changes that need to be made, all for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to give us five, um, five steps, if you will. Now, you, as we go through these, you may be already doing these, all of them, and that's awesome. You may be doing some of them. You may be doing none of them, all right? I think there's something in this for all of us, regardless of our age, whether we're young and just starting out, a teenager, or whether we're retired. I think there's still something to be said in God's word for us with regards to financial freedom. Let's look at these together. The first one is this. Keep good records. Keep good records. Uh, know where your money goes, actually where it comes from and where it goes. Very important. Know where your money comes from and know where it, it goes. What do we need to do? Write it down. Write it down. You know, so often we go through life, well, I've got it right here. I've got it right here. And I have learned early on, I don't have it right here. I think I have it right here, but ultimately I don't have it right here. Uh, one of the... Um, um, uh, I guess commands you could say, challenges, encouragements my dad gave me uh, coming out of high school, coming out of college uh, is, you know, when you're in interviews, he, he always told me, he said, when, you, when you're interviewing for something, you're talking to somebody, you know, sit up straight, look them in the eye, right? And always have a paper and a pen to write something down. And I remember that. I mean, whether you write anything or not, you're prepared to do so. And I've struggled with, uh, I've had interviews, a lot of interviews just in this position of people who have come in to uh, interview different positions for this church, ministries in this church, and just come in empty-handed. My staff's listening, he's one of my pet peeves. Don't come in with nothing in your hands. Come in prepared to write something down because you're vested, you're interested, right? When it comes to life, a lot of times we, we got it right here and we don't have it right there. The first principle is to write it down. The first principle is to keep good records so that you know where the money comes from, you know where it goes. Obviously, this takes time. Are we willing to put in the time for the long-term benefits? Proverbs 27, verses 23 and 24, the first part of 24 says this, be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds, for riches do not endure forever. That's Proverbs 27, 23, and 24. Now, you hear that or you read that, you're like, okay, Pastor Brian, I'm not a farmer. This doesn't apply to me. No, it does. 
Let me explain. You see, in that time, in that context, wealth was measured by what you physically had. How many animals you had, how much ground you had, how many people you had working for you. And the more you had, the wealthier you were. Now, translate that into our context today. It has to do with savings account, checking account, stocks, bonds, 401k, retirement, all of those assets, CDs that we have that, that uh, allows us to to say we're, we're wealthy, we're not, or we have this much money, we don't, right? So Proverbs is saying you have to know the condition of that. Know the condition of your finances. Now, it's interesting to note who wrote all this. King Solomon's the, the writer of, of Proverbs, and we know, um, well, we know from, from Scripture and, and history that he was the wealthiest man alive. It's interesting to note just how wealthy. I did a little research this week, and you may prove me wrong, but according to my uh, research, the wealthiest person right now on the earth is Elon Musk. Uh, maybe somebody else, but that's who I found. $251.3 billion is his net worth. I mean, you get into the B billions, I don't care what name's up there, that's just ridiculous, right? If King Solomon's wealth, and this is a conservative approach, was, was translated to today, you want to take a guess of what he would be worth? Elon Musk can't even hold a candle to this guy. 2.1 trillion dollars. That's with a T. That was King Solomon's worth, and that's a conservative approach. The dude had some money. He had some cash, right? The Bible said he was the, well, the well, uh, wisest man, wealthiest and wisest man alive as well. And so here's a guy that had all this wealth and a lot of wisdom, and he's writing these things. He has something to, to say about money, and he understands a little bit. God gave him the ability to write this down. Proverbs 27. It's saying that you and I, we need to know the condition of our finances. We need to know the condition of our finances. You've often heard the phrase, money talks, right? Anybody ever hear that's, that phrase, money talks? I don't even know who developed it, how long ago, but oftentimes it has to do with, with power, right? With authority. Like the, the wealthier I am, you know, I, I can do things or people just are going to let me slide because I'm wealthy and, and I have prestige and I'm known. I remember a friend of mine who's a police officer, he pulled this guy over one time, and this guy was exceeding the speed limit, like by 20, 30 miles an hour at least. And he got up to the guy, and he recognized who the guy was, incidentally, and the guy rolled his window down, and the police officer said, my friend said, hey, can driver's license and registration. And the guy kind of looked at him before he got into his glove compartment and says, officer, do you know who I am? My friend said, yes, I do. Driver's license and registration, please. And I'm like, yes. Give it to him, right? But... The, the whole the saying is true in a lot of people's hearts and minds. You know, power comes with money. Money talks. Well, can I tell you this morning, for most of us, money does not talk. Money does not talk. No, what it does is it slips away without saying anything, and it doesn't even leave a forwarding address. That's the reality of money in a lot of our, our homes, is it not? And we're left, what happened? What happened? Where did it go? It was just here. It was just here a minute ago, and it's gone. It just slips away. Know where your money comes from. Know where it goes. Can I tell you this morning, church, ignorance of your financial condition plus easy credit equals disaster. And that's the state of where we're at right now. And a lot of us are in the middle of that right now. We're ignorant to our financial condition and the credit card companies are making it easier and easier for you to get credit and get credit cards. Just get them and fill them up, baby. Fill them up and we'll take that 25, 30% interest. Right? And a lot of us... A lot of people are in that, in that hole. You get dug, you, uh, you dig in this hole, dig in this hole, and you can't get out. Keep good records. Write it down. Don't rely on keeping it in your head. That's the first thing. The second thing is this, budgeting. Some of you are hearing this word for the first time. Like, what does that even mean? Is that a real word? Budgeting. Budgeting is simply this. It is planned spending. Budgeting is planned spending. It's, again, writing down everything where the money is going to go. It's writing it down. It's, it's doing this on a yearly basis, maybe every six months. And what this will do, budgeting will help you tell your money where to go rather than wondering where it went. Isn't that a better place to be? When you much sooner know where it's going rather than wondering what happened. Where'd it go? It just slipped away. No forwarding address. Budgeting will do that. Let's go back to King Solomon, Proverbs 21, verse 5. Proverbs 21, verse 5 says this, Plan carefully, and you will have plenty. If you act too quickly, you will never have enough. You will never have enough. 
There is a popular misconception out there, and I fear too many people fall into this trap. This idea that financial freedom is determined by how much you make. Can I tell you this morning, that is a lie. Financial freedom is does not determine by how much you make. It is determined by how much you spend. Financial freedom is determined by how much you spend. Why? Because we can never have enough. Can never have enough. Just one more dollar. Just one more dollar. Budget. Budget. The problem with so many of us is that our yearnings will exceed our earnings. Our yearnings will exceed our earnings. What we think we want, what we think we need will always be greater than what we're actually making. Proverbs 21 verse 20. Proverbs 21 20 says this, the wise have wealth and luxury, but the fools spend whatever they get. 80% of Americans are in debt. 80% of Americans, for the most part, and I can't say this with definitiveness. Is that a word? I just used it. With assuredness. But I would venture to guess most of that 80% are living in the second part of this verse. They're foolish. Whatever I get, just spend it. Get rid of it. Budgeting helps us plan where it's going to go rather than wondering where it went. Budgeting helps eliminate impulse buying. Anybody know what impulse buying is? Anybody suffer from impulse buying? Do not raise your hand. I mean, right? It's, I've got to have it right now, right now. Why? Because the sale ends tomorrow. And if I don't get it tomorrow, it will never be this cheap again. I've got to have it. Right? Am I right? Is that what it is? I don't care if you're doing it or not. You have to agree that's what it is. You know how you save from impulse buying? 50%, 40%, 50%, 40%, you know how to save 100%? Don't get it. Don't buy it. God bless her, my neighbor who passed away. I didn't realize the impulse buyer she was. My word, until they had gone through her, her basement. It was kind of that dark place that nobody went to. I was only down there a few times in the last 15, 20 years. But um, one of the, the cousins who went through that, um, when she had passed away, brought out a, a, a hose end. You know, like you screw into the end of your hose, a nozzle. He says, here, do you need a nozzle? I said, well, I mean, I'll, I'll always use those dumb things. They're plastic. They break so easy. He says, yeah, take it. I said, well, that's all right. I don't need it. You take it. No, we've got 39 more of them downstairs. Who needs 40 hose nozzles? That's just one of many. Budgeting helps eliminate impulse buying. All right? Take good records. Budget. Second, th- third thing is this. Save. You know, 30% of Americans do not save. And a lot of these stats come from uh, Forbes. They come from other areas. There's a couple great Christian authors out there that work with finances. You may know them. Uh, Ron Blue, um, um, uh, Dave Ramsey. We're going to talk more about some of these things moving forward. But uh, a lot of these statistics come from a variety of resources. That's why I didn't uh, put all of them up and label who, where they come from. But 30% of Americans do not save. Of those Americans who do save, the 70% who do, 70% of that 70%, have less than $15,000 saved. Does that make sense? So of the people who do save on average, they only have about 15,000 saved. So for most of them, if not all of them, depending on their financial situation and their living expenses, if something were to happen abruptly, physically, they can't work, whatever, you know, something happens where they can't receive an income, they'd barely be able to survive for four months. That's on average. And one of the biggest factors... It's interesting. All the research shows this. I looked at several different sources. One of the biggest factors of why people do not save is envy. It's envy. Because we get so caught up in what other people have. We're in somebody's home, and boy, I could use that. They have that. Why can't I have that? My neighbor just got a new truck. I need a new truck. Why can't I get a new truck? My friend just went to this place on vacation. Well, I want to go to this place on vacation. Why can't I do that? And it's envy. It's trying to outdo the other. You heard the the saying, keep up with the Joneses, right? I don't know who the Joneses are, but it's more not about the Joneses anymore. It's keep up with the Whites and the Joneses and the Millers and the whoever and just name the name and on down the list, right? Our oldest son for about four years or so, I think, he uh, has been working for a company out of Pittsburgh. A couple friends of of his got him into this and when he's home from Christmas, he's able to help. And this company started seven, eight years ago putting Christmas lights on, on homes. People will pay for anything. 
My wife was going uh, near our house the other day and saw a vehicle that, that I don't know what the label was. I forget what the tagline was, but it was a dog pooper scooper picker upper person. And they went around and just cleaned it all up out of your yards and you pay them for it. We will pay for anything. Well, this company started uh, about seven, eight years ago, and they have grown to be a conglomerate, multi-million dollar business. And Tyler said it's amazing. Uh, he, he's usually, he's not home to put the lights up, but when he gets home, he's able to go with the crews to take them down. And he said, we'll go into these different plans, all these houses. And he said, it's so funny watching uh, homeowners trying to outdo the other. And so not every time, but most of the times we're taking lights down and here will come one, two, three homeowners from, a, from neighboring houses and asking about them and, hey, who are you and who do you work for? And, hey, can, can I get a quote and stuff? It's like they all want to outdo the other. I've said the other week, I'm so glad I don't live in a plan, but if I did, I'd want to be beside, be beside somebody who goes all out with their lights so I can put that sign ditto with the arrow pointing right to them. And that's my Christmas, right? Some of you men are saying amen to that, right? Save. Do not allow envy, comparing, competing with others to prevent you from saving. Don't allow that to happen. God tells us of all things, which is interesting, when it comes to keep getting lessons about saving, of all the things God could have gave us a lesson or give us an illustration of how to save, he uses ants. Ants. Proverbs chapter 6, look at this. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no uh, prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. God says, take heed of what they're doing. Learn from them. Save. Write it down. Take good records. Budget. Save. Here's the third, fourth one. The fourth principle is this. We want to have financial freedom. It's generosity. Generosity. Let's go back to Proverbs again. Chapter 3, verses 9 through 10. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. Put God first. Listen, church, we want God to bless something, put him first. You want God to bless your work, put him first in the middle of your work. You want God to bless your relationships, put him first. Don't get the relationship and then say, well, God, uh, now I need you to come fix this person for me. No, put him first before it ever starts. You want God to be first in your work, in your business, and growing it, or you want to be blessed, put God first. You want uh, your marriage to be blessed, your marriage to grow, your marriage to be fruitful, and all that God wants to be, put him first. You want your finances to be in order and God to bless them, put him first. When we put God first, things work out a little differently. And a lot of times, every time, really in our favor, in God's perfect plans. Just putting him first doesn't mean it's going to be blessed the way we want it to be blessed. But God will do it according to his perfect plan and his will. A couple points under generosity. How can we start? What's a good starting point? Let's go with this, tithe. Tithe is a good starting point. Now, the word tithe simply means 10%. Now, why God chose that, I don't know. He could have chose 20. He could have chose 40, 50, 80, 90. I don't know. But he chose this, tithe, 10%. People give more than that. People will give till it hurts. There's a, a saying out there, give till it hurts. You can't out, out give God. And that's true. That's true. But this is the only place with regards to tithing, the only place that we're going to find in Scripture where God says, put me to the test. Test me in this. You'll find other Scriptures that say people tried to test God, but this is the one, Malachi 3, where he says, no, test me in this. Go ahead. See what I'll do for you. Let's look at it together. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 towards the tail end of the Old Testament. The Bible says this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be found in my house. Test me in this, God says, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Church, that is not just applicable for Old Testament times B.C. before Christ. That is applicable today. God is saying, test me in this. See if I won't bless you beyond you can even imagine. Now, that's faith. And we struggle in that because we don't see the outcome. We don't have our crystal ball and we don't know, right? We don't a lot of times make decisions unless we know the outcome. 
And that's, that's true of us, and that's good. But faith is trusting in God that his word is true, every bit as true as when it is written, and true today for me right here, right now. That's faith. And Jesus, God says, test me in it. See, I'll prove it to you. I don't change. Hebrews reminds us of that. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He says, test me. And that's not just for the Old Testament. Look with me in 1 Corinthians 16. You're taking notes, jot this down. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. It says this. On the first day, Paul writes, on the first day of every week, he challenges the church in Corinth. He says, each one of you should set aside a sum of money, a tithe, an offering, Paul is saying, in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Paul's talking about uh, saving up money, bringing money, bringing an offering to care for the poor that are in Jerusalem. He's saying the first day, Sunday, first day of the week, bring that tithe, bring that offering. So I don't have to come door to door knocking, hey, we need some money. Just bring that. We're using it for God's glory in this community and for these people. Start with a tithe, 10%, right up front, right at the very beginning taking it from the first fruits. I remember growing up as a kid, my, my grandfather, my grandfather used to talk to me about tithing, not all the time, but as a young kid, I didn't know what in the world he was talking about. And he's saying about, you know, you need to give your first fruits, Brian, give your first fruits. I'm thinking, Pap, what is that? Oranges, apples, pears, I love those things. He says, no, 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 the first fruits of what you make. Now, that didn't mean a lot to me back then, but I think about that even today. Before all these other demands take from what God has given me and blessed me with, giving the first fruits to him, to be used by him and for him and for his church. Give with a gratitude as a declaration of faith. I'm giving to you, Lord, a declaration of faith. You're going to use it for your glory. And the last thing, make God your first priority. Make God your first priority. Why? Because he owns it all. He owns it all. You say, well, I've worked so hard for where I am, for the status that I have, for the finances that I have, for the business that I've created. I put long hours, blood, sweat, tears, and whatever else came out of me to make this business the way it is and put me in a position that that I'm in today. My question to you is, who gave you those skills? Who gave you that knowledge? Who gave you that ability? Who gave you your next heartbeat or your next breath? God did. Who created you? God did. And when we have the eternal perspective, which is what Jesus wants, we have the eternal heavenly perspective, everything changes. We realize, God, it's all yours. It's all yours. Do with it what you will for your glory. Generosity. The last thing is this, quickly. Contentment. Contentment. We struggle in probably a lot of these areas, but this might want to be be one of the biggest Contentment. Ecclesiastes 6, 9, enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Ecclesiastes 6, 9, enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Hebrews 13, 5, Hebrews 13, 5, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God said, I will never, fa- I will never fail you or leave you, and I will never abandon you or forsake you. Leave and forsake. Don't love money. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Learn to be thankful and enjoy what you have. Contentment is learning to be thankful and enjoying what you have. If you have your Bibles, you want to flip over to Philippians chapter 4, a little farther in the New Testament for those of you who are quick with the sword drill. Philippians 4, there's a verse in there, tucked away in there, that we have taken out of context for years and years and years. Philippians is probably one of the most intimate um, letters that Paul has ever written to the church in Philippi. It is uh, uh, just such a personal letter with so much passion, uh, probably more so than any of the other writings that uh, Paul uh, has written. And uh, tucked away in chapter 4 in verse 13 is a verse that probably most of us have heard and know very well. And it says this, I can do all things through him who gives me the strength. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And so often we've looked at that verse and said, oh, that's great. That means I'm like a spiritual superman. I can do anything. God, give me the strength. I can do anything, right? Now, the reality is if God gives you the strength to do something and he has a plan for you to do it, it's going to get done. And if you're not going to do it and we're going to be stubborn, he'll use somebody else. When God has a plan, his plans get done. His promises are true, right? There's not one that isn't. 
And so we, we've taken that verse to the context of, well, then I can just do whatever I want. And that, that's not what Paul was saying. He's speaking of contentment, how we know that. Back up a few verses. Look at verse 10 with me. I think we have it on the screen. There it is. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have, watch this, learned in whatever situations I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to, to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, hunger, abundance and need. And here it is. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul is speaking of being content, knowing what it is to have much and have nothing. Knowing how to survive with little and with much with friends and with none, and fill in the blank. And he's saying, how can I survive? Because through Christ I can. He gives me the strength. I can do all things through him, whether I have much or whether I have little. It doesn't matter. Paul says, I can be content. And he has learned, notice that? Learned to be content. It wasn't something that just came to him right away. He had to learn it. God had to help him. It's spiritual discipline. Taking steps to financial planning, financial freedom. Five things. Now let's apply it, and then we'll jump into the Lord's table together. We'll go through this quickly. If you're taking notes this morning, you'll see on the bottom of your notes there's a chart, two columns. And one column is how most people approach their finances. And then there's another column, God's approach, and how he will, will bless. Let's look at those quickly. For most people, maybe you fall into this. Most people use this structure, this format. You earn it, number one, then we jump right in and enjoy it, number two. Third thing is we repay it, and those might be debts or, or bills that we owe. And then the fourth thing is we save it. That's for the future. And then the last thing, if there's anything left, we'll give it, eternal. The, the last fruits of what we have. If there's anything left, we'll give God a, give God a tip, right? Think of it, you go into a, a restaurant and the waiter and waitress, whoever, waiter or waitress, and they're, you know, they're predicated, your, your tip for them is going to be predicated on how well they do, right? I mean, were they good service? Were they right on time? Was my drink filled as soon as it was only a third empty? I mean, right on top of it, right? Was the food good? Knowing that she or he had nothing to do with making it, but if it's not good and it's cold and it's not right, it's their fault. And so then we decide at the end of that how much tip we're going to give them. Don't shake your heads at me. You've all been there. And church, we do that with God. Well, how good are you, God? And we don't even rationalize that half the time. We give him what's left. We give him what's left. Here's the order God blesses. Number one, earn it. The next thing is tithe it right up front. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, tithe it, save it, number three, then repay it, number four, and last, enjoy it. Enjoy it. That's God's order. I believe that's a biblical order of how he blesses. Let me conclude with these four takeaways. First one is this. Out-of-control finances are symptoms of an out-of-control life. That is true. That is proven. Take that to heart this morning. Some of you may be in the middle of that right now. Some of you may have all this together, but you know somebody who needs this. Maybe God's calling you to have a conversation with them. Out-of-control finances are symptoms, symptoms of an out-of-control life. Second thing is this. We need more than a financial planner. We look high and low for financial planners. More than that, we need a financial or a life manager, excuse me, and that life manager is Jesus Christ. We want him to bless, we'll then put him first in this area. Third thing is this, behind all of our financial problems is unbelief. This is truth. This is reality. Behind all of our financial problems is unbelief. Unbelief in that God can't do what he says he's going to do. God's not going to come through here. This doesn't make any sense in my mind, therefore it will not happen. I remember we were just, uh, had, had Tyler, it was January 2003, our firstborn. I was working part-time as a youth director and full-time as a um, Christian school teacher 
Uh, you don't make too much in either of those two fields, to say the least. Uh, King Solomon had nothing to worry about. I was not going to pass him in, in wealth. And my wife, Kim, was, was teaching at a public school, sixth grade, and uh, we were able to, because she was able to keep her, her insurance, we were able to allow her to take six months off. So she took from January the whole way till the new school year, which would start in, in August, in the middle of August. And I had a mortgage, I had a car payment, and I had a little dude that was eating like crazy, and that has not changed 20 years later. And we were coming home, I don't know where we were coming home from, pulling up to our house, and we get up to the, the mailbox, and we were just talking, I'm like, we have got this particular bill, and I have absolutely zero idea how we're going to pay it. We do not have any money. So when I look at this list, earn it, enjoy it, repay it, save it, give it, two of them weren't even there. Number one, there was no enjoying, so that's off. Earn it, I can't enjoy anything. I'm repaying, I'm saving, and I don't know how I'm going to tithe anything. And Kim, being the spiritual leader at that time that she was, I've learned so much from her, was, you know what, we're going to trust God. We're going to trust God in this, and we're believing that he's going to come through. We had a bill, $45 and change. I had no idea where the money's coming from. It was due in a couple days. We went to the mailbox, opened the mailbox. There's a letter from an older couple from our church, Cecil Alliance Church. And they opened the letter and there's a note that says, we just appreciate all you're doing for our youth. I was part-time youth director. Love what you're doing. We pray for you often. And there's a check. You want to guess what the check was for? $50. I had $4 and change to enjoy. I was on cloud nine. That became back part of my list again. Unbelief. We believe that God won't do what he says he does. The last thing is this. We're going to move into communion together. We need to let Jesus first be the CEO, the chief executive officer of our lives, and then the CFO, the chief financial officer. Let Jesus be the CFO, e CEO first, then the CFO. Allow him to be our life manager. As we enter into communion, we're reminded that in these moments, we want to get right with the Lord, and we want God to speak and, and, and churn up those things that are separating us from him. Anything that separates us from God is sin. Poor money management and using it, God's resources, his uh, blessings to us in, a, in an ungodly manner is sin. Let's call it what it is. As we prepare to take communion in the Lord's table, maybe this is an opportunity for you this morning to pray and ask God to help you in this area. If you're at home, I encourage you to grab some juice or bread if you don't have it already. God's Word says when Jesus met with the disciples in the upper room before he was going to be crucified, the Bible says he took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and he said, this, this bread is a symbol of my body broken for you. They didn't understand what was going to happen. We're on the other side of it now. We know what happened. Jesus' body was beaten, battered, bruised. He was put on that cross, the great exchange. He took our place. And he blessed it and said, this bread is a symbol of my body. Then he took the cup. And he said, this is the covenant, the new covenant in my blood. See, his blood had to be shed for the remission of sins once and for all. He said, this is a symbol of my blood shed for you. Every time you drink of it, drink and do it in remembrance of me. Do this until I come back. And tucked away in those verses we read often is this taking a posture of allowing God to speak to us in these moments. I encourage you to do that. Allow God to speak to you. Maybe it's in the idea of finances we talked about this morning. Maybe it's unconfessed sin. Give that to him. Let him forgive you. Let him put you in right standing with the Father. This meal that we have is not a meal of Washington Alliance Church. It has everything to do with the relationship with Jesus. You need not be a member of this church to partake of the Lord's table, just that you have a relationship with him. We have the bread and the cup. We also have some communion kits and some gluten-free as well. Both tables are the same. I encourage you to come to both, or not go to both, but split up. They're both the same at both tables. I'm going to pray for the bread and the, the juice, and when you're ready, I'm going to ask you to come, get the elements, go back to your seat, and go ahead and take them, either by yourself or with family members. A great time, uh, moms and dads, to explain this to your children. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you 
for the truth of your word. We thank you, though, most of all, Jesus, for what you did for us. Being the one to take our place on that cross, that old rugged cross. Lord, your body that was broken, it was beaten, it was bruised for us. As we eat of this bread, we're reminded of that. And Lord, knowing that the only way for us to have freedom of our sin, the guilt and chains that bind us of our sin, was for your blood to be shed on that cross that day. And Lord, as we drink of this juice, we're reminded of that once and for all, for the remission of sins. And Lord, in these moments, Lord, may you open up our hearts. May your spirit move in such a way that change is brought to light, needed change is brought to light, sins that need confessed is brought to the light, and we confess them to you, the only one who can forgive us of our sins. Lord Jesus, may we do that now. Amen. Amen. When you're ready, we invite you to come forward.